Welcome back. Meteorologist Dana Fulton is back with her deep dive into issues impacting Wisconsin's environment. And today, she's taking us inside a special kind of fire. When it comes to watching fires, there's something almost primal about it, whether it's your backyard fire or a wildfire burning out west. In fact, some of the fires that we see burning here in Wisconsin, they have a benefit. They're called prescribed burns or controlled burns done by the DNR. So to learn more about that, we're in the DNR Control Center right now. Michelle Wateka, the prescribed burn specialist, has more on how this does benefit our wildlife and our communities. What is a prescribed burn? We see wildfires popping up. What does it mean when you guys are actually doing a prescribed burn? A prescribed burn is a fire that is set for a specific objective within a certain perimeter um, and it stays within that perimeter. And uh, so it's really different than a wildfire that can be accidentally started for a variety of reasons. Um, it does not have a perimeter. It has a much more explosive fire behavior um, to the point where you cannot control it. Our whole intent with prescribed fire is to light fire on days where the weather conditions would provide a lot more modified fire behavior. I mean, instead of the walls of flame that you see in typical wildfire stories. I mean, we're talking about fire that is, you know, two, three, four, five feet high. And it's something that's a lot more manageable because we're choosing certain weather conditions in order to light that burn. We have a lot of really um, precious ecosystems that do rely on fire in the state. And so it's a, it's a large workload. Um, every year we have to work together to prioritize it so that we can all focus on what's considered, you know, the most valuable units to get. Um, and then at that point, the uh, assignments are divvied out to our burn bosses. And once the season starts, once we have that ground thaw and um, we have dry enough vegetation, they're just looking for those weather windows. Speaking of the fuels, uh, Wisconsin is a fantastically outdoorsy state. Yes, it is. It is in our culture. <laughs> and, and, and people know when they go out. I mean, they recognize these prairie lands, these right. grasslands, these wooded areas. Right. Can you describe the difference perhaps between what might be a, a grass burn versus through a forested area? I know I've seen a few burns near um, the Ice Age Trail, which is a little more forested. Yeah. How do you set those different areas up? We may combine different uh, vegetation types if we know we can burn it within the same weather window. You know, um, so what we'll do is is we'll work off of man-made or natural boundaries like a creek or um, a road, and we'll try to design what's the safest way to burn that unit with the safest shape, um, you know, no jagged edges or things that are hard for crews to move around. So, I mean, there's a lot of thought just put into how the burn unit is designed. Talking about the spring season, you have to sure. wait till the thaw is through, which can be a little hard to nail down in Wisconsin. And we also have to look at, um, I mean, it's it's breeding season for a lot of animals, keeping an eye Absolutely. on rabbits and turkeys and the young poults running around. Does that factor into the decision also? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I mean, we burn for wildlife and so you know in order to do this management activity we have to do it in a way that mitigates a lot of that negative impact and so for uh, for our less common, for our rare, endangered, threatened species what we actually do is we track um, uh, reptiles and amphibians, we have a little calendar and all of our uh, district ecologists and, and other uh, staff in the, around the state actually monitor when these reptiles and amphibians are coming out of hibernation. And as soon as that happens, any burn unit that has those uh, species sighted in them, immediately burning is shut down. So you guys are really in tune to, I'm assuming, the data and, and diving through how things are changing in our climate? Yes, that impacts, absolutely. Like you said, what we see on the ground and and how you schedule the prescribed burns. Right, yeah. right. So we are focusing a lot more on, you know, we see in the future um, models and all researchers are telling us that um, species like aspen, mm -hmm. um, not going to be as habitable in the south for aspen. Uh, species like, you know, western hemlock, are we going to see that still in the state still? Um, one thing that is 
uh, modeled to be prevalent, more prevalent is oak. And so what we're trying to do now is, okay, if oak is going to be um, increasing on the landscape, where, where do we need to help proliferate it so that when other species are, you know, shifted and no, are possibly no longer there, what is going to be there to take its place? And, you know, when we look at the vegetation composition, obviously that impacts what wildlife we can expect to see there. So it's not just about making sure that these tree species can subsist. It's also about making sure that the wildlife depend on them are still going to be there as well. I mentioned that fire ecology itself is a relatively young science, um, but I think it's also important to point out uh, sometimes we have the habit of saying, oh, oh, this is newly discovered and this is this new thing we're doing. And we look at our indigenous communities and we see that this is something they've been, been doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's part of who they are. It's part of their culture. Um, so as I stand here in, you know, my state government capacity, I, I do really need to acknowledge that, you know, this is something that has been used for wildlife management, for land management, for, you know, as long as there have been people in Wisconsin. When we come back, the tragic story of one man for whom addiction, mental health, and pandemic anxiety proved too much.